What is up Insaners and welcome to a new video where we'll be helping you prepare for the big double game week 26. We'll talk about all the teams who have a double game week in game week 26 and deep dive into some really important decisions that you as FPL managers need to make this week. This video will also help you plan your transfers and chip strategy to get the best possible rank over this crucial period of games. This is a very important week guys, it can easily make or break your FPL season. Just don't stress out, I'm sure you'll have a lot of fun playing the game across this whole time. Trust me guys, it's gonna be awesome. A lot of you won't be watching all the games, but try to get as much information you can to take your final decisions. If you enjoyed today's video and find it useful, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe to our channel Insanely Football if you want to see more FPL content. Also don't forget to press the bell icon if you want to get notified of our coming videos. Now let's get started with all the good stuff. We'll first talk a bit about the fixtures covering the double game week games along with the fixtures leading to the blank game week 29. Just so that's easier for everyone to understand, the double game week 26 fixtures were announced just after a minute or two post the game week 25 deadline. It was frustrating for managers who played their wildcard based on Ben's predictions and though he was bang on, surely FPL managers would have been really happy getting all that useful information prior to the deadline. Based on Ben's predictions, we made our own version of his fixture planner and spoke about it in our last video. For those of you who haven't seen this before, a quick recap. We have listed all the Premier League teams on the left side of the screen. On the top, we have mentioned different game weeks as different columns. Now inside each column is the opponent, teams on the extreme left are facing. In the game week 26 and 27 column, a lot of spaces have two teams mentioned, which means the teams on the left is facing those two opponents. In the game week 29 column, you'll see blanks and that means the teams on the left do not have a game that week and it's a blank game week for them. According to Premier League's announcement, 14 teams have a double game week in 26. The ones that particularly stand out are Aston Villa, Tottenham, Man City and Everton. The idea would be to plan some of our transfers this week around these teams. We also know that game week 27 is a double game week for Man City and Southampton as both of them face each other along with an extra game for both teams. There was some information on game week 29 as well and we know that game week 29 will have an additional fixture where Aston Villa hosts Tottenham at Villa Park. Now let's look at all the teams who have a double game week in game week 26 along with the rest of the teams who are playing single matches in the upcoming game weeks. Starting with Aston Villa who play Leeds United and Sheffield United in game week 26. They look like a good bet with a fixture in game week 29 as well but with injuries to Matty Cash and even Jack Grealish, Villa look a bit vulnerable in defence and attack. They also have a game against Everton that needs to be rescheduled and for now, we don't have information on that. Everton have a few players back from injury, the major one being Dominic Calvert-Lewin and got the penalty for Everton's second goal against Liverpool in the Merseyside derby. They face Southampton and West Brom, two teams are struggling to keep out goals at the moment. To be honest, Man City are the pick of the lot. They face West Ham United and Wolves, both are tricky fixtures but the form Man City is in, they should get past both teams quite easily. They also have a double game week in game week 27 against Southampton, so Man City triple up is surely on the cards if you're not on it yet. Tottenham are also one of the teams to look out for for the next few games. They have Burnley and Fulham who looked easier opponents but Spurs have made it difficult for themselves after winning just one of their last five games. They also have another game against Southampton that is yet to be scheduled. Spurs London rivals Chelsea play Man United and Liverpool, probably the toughest matchup any team has in game week 26. Thomas Tuchel would face his first real test since becoming the Chelsea boss and it'll be really interesting to see how he prepares for this challenge. Chelsea do have a decent run of fixtures after the double game week. Coming to two of the biggest teams in England, Man United and Liverpool also have a couple of games to play in game week 26. Both of them face Chelsea and easier teams in Sheffield United and Crystal Palace. Out of the two, Liverpool has the easier fixture, facing Fulham, Wolves and Arsenal in their next three games. The worrying thing is that Liverpool have been in really poor form, having lost four of their last five games. Man United on the other hand are unbeaten in five games but are facing Chelsea, Man City and West Ham in three of their next four games. Leicester City is the last top six team to have a double game week. They play Arsenal and Burnley. Again, not the easiest of games, but the duo of Harvey Barnes and James Madison has worked out well in their past few games. Other teams like Wolves, Burnley, Sheffield United, Crystal Palace, Fulham and West Brom also have a double game week. Burnley face Leicester City and Tottenham with both games looking tough on paper for Sean Dyke's men. A lot of FPL managers are holding Burnley defenders right now, so there are a few decisions to be made there. Wolves fixtures are a lot better from game week 30, so people on a wildcard in game week 30 or 31 can look at Wolves assets then. Fulham and Burnley also have a double, but the fixtures are not that appealing. We'll discuss a few options from these teams later on in the video. In terms of some single game week teams, there's Brighton and Leeds that stand out. Leeds had a double game week in game week 25 and they have some decent options to put on the bench till game week 29. Brighton don't have any double game weeks, but they have been in really good form from a defensive point of view. 
Their fixtures get a bit tricky from game week 30, but they face West Brom, Southampton and Newcastle in three of the next four games. Southampton is another team to look out for in the next few game weeks. They had a double in game week 25 and also have one in game week 27, playing Sheffield United and Man City. So these are all the fixtures for the double game week in 26 and 27, along with the blank in game week 29. Now before we get into covering specific topics, we'll talk a bit about chip strategy. There are a couple of ways to navigate the coming game weeks. Again, it depends on your team, what kind of players you have and what are the chips that you have left with you. So if you've already used your bench boost, second wildcard, triple captain or free hit, then you won't be able to use these and you'll have to alter your strategy a bit. We know for certain that game week 26 is a huge double game week with lots of teams playing two games and 29 will be a big blank game week. There's a double game week in 27 as well and there might be a couple of small double game weeks later on the season but we don't need to worry about those right now. So strategy one or the option one would be to use a triple captain chip in the big double game week 26. You prepare your game week 26 team by making transfers and taking a few hits if you feel they're going to be beneficial. The idea here is to take advantage of the top players of premium picks and get double points from them. From the first look, Bruno Fernandes, Ikai Gunagan or even Harry Kane could be a few options to go for. We'll do a separate video where we'll talk about the triple captaincy chip and some options in detail but game week 26 is a great week to use it. The second option is that you play your wildcard in game week 26 and get at least a good 11 that plays twice in 26. This helps you boost your overall score along with probably having a bench keeping in mind the game week 29 blank. The strategy also allows you to use your bench boost chip in game week 27 or game week 33 later on the season irrespective of whether you have your free hit available or not. Now some of you might not have the second wildcard available with you or would like to play it later on in game week 30 or 31. If that is the case and you have your bench boost chip available then play that in game week 26. Just try to keep a balance between single and double game week players there and if you don't have your free hit chip available then navigating through the blank game week 29 would be really difficult. A lot of you might have used your free hit in game week 18 which had only 6 fixtures but for those of you who still have it, using your free hit chip in game week 26 is another option. You can get a good playing 11 and probably return to your original squad if it doesn't have a lot of double game week players but as players from Arsenal, Brighton, Leeds and West Ham all of which play in the blank game week 29. Again these are different strategy options available and there's no straightforward answer in terms of which strategy is better. It totally depends on your team and what chips you have left. We have already used our free hit in game week 18 and bench boost in game week 19 so we have the triple captain chip available which we are thinking of using in game week 26. We also have the wildcard available which we'll probably play in game week 31 depending on how our team is doing just before that. Now that we've covered the different chip strategies available for game week 26, let's deep dive more into today's video with our first hot topic, beating the pep roulette. Now Man City are in great form right now and they are 10 points clear of Man United and Leicester City who are in 2nd and 3rd place. They are on a record breaking streak winning 18 successive matches in all competitions. The biggest problem with Man City that we witness every season is the risk of rotation with all their players. Pep is known to rest players during fixture congestion which is not great news for us FPL managers. This essentially makes any double game week for most of the City players as a risky single game week. So the question remains, is a triple up on Man City necessary? Obviously it's not essential and you have some really good options but the form City is showing defensively is really hard to ignore right now. Let's talk about their defensive options. If we exclude Edison, there are three standout options in defense. John Stones, Ruben Diaz and Joao Cancelo. Out of these three, Ruben Diaz looks like the most nailed on in the Premier League. He's only missed a game this season because of illness. There's a strong case to be made that John Stones and Laporte will rotate for the second spot keeping the Champions League games in mind. City's defensive numbers are mighty impressive and Diaz also gets a higher bonus point system score than other City defenders. Joao Cancelo is the third defender in this list. He has been terrific this season playing in a number of positions giving the citizens a variety of options thanks to his versatility. Though Cancelo has become indispensable in the City lineup, he has started in the last 5 games in the Premier League. Also with the Champions League games coming up, there are very high chances that he might get rested for one of the double game week fixtures in game week 26 or 27. A double up on the City defence surely makes sense but the best combination might be Diaz and Cancelo which is a bit higher in value. It gives you the benefit of bonus points from Diaz and the additional attacking return from Kinsello at the risk of the latter playing a single game in the double game week. Coming to City's midfield, there are two sets of options. First is the premium midfield combination of Raheem Sterling and Kevin De Bruyne. Sterling is the fifth highest scoring midfielder in the game this season. The England international has six attacking returns in his last eight appearances. In the last five matches alone, he has three goals and one assist to his name. He also ranks second in terms of XG in the same time, only behind Salah. Sterling has also created 9 chances but the problem with Sterling is his price. 
He's priced around the mid 11 million mark right now, and for that price, he's offering much less value as compared to the likes of Gundogan and Foden. His ownership is also quite low as compared to some of the other premiums in the game. So unless you're looking to go differential and captain him in your squad, there are better options available elsewhere in terms of overall value. Now another interesting choice available is Kevin De Bruyne. He has been a great fantasy asset over the past few years and looks to be back from injury that he suffered earlier in the season. In spite of missing 6 games for City this season, he still has 10 assists in the league, a number that is only bettered by Fernandes and Grealish having played more games than the Belgian. Now the problem with KDB again is his price. He's almost close to 12 million in price and that would make you think twice before getting him. It is manageable if it's a direct swap from Sterling, otherwise you will have to take out the likes of Salah or Bruno Fernandes to get him in your team. Now there's no doubt that his involvement in the game would be second to none which gives him a higher chance to score bonus points than Sterling. I feel overall there are two ways to look at KDB. You can get him early as his ownership is quite low among the active teams at the moment. This would surely give you an edge over the other FPL managers. On the other hand, you're spending 12 million for a player who will surely give you points but has serious question marks over his playing time considering Man City has Champions League games as well to deal with. In my opinion, one could wait to see how things pan out for KDB and then take a call of getting him in your team. His points no doubt would be differential at the moment but won't seriously hurt your rank if you miss out on them. He's definitely one to keep an eye on for the future games. Coming to the budget midfield of Ikai Gundogan and Phil Foden. Gundogan has been a revelation in midfield this season, providing an insane value to all FPL managers. In the last 5 game weeks, he scored 4 goals and provided 2 assists and this is in spite of him missing one game due to injury against Everton. Now there were a lot of question marks on his fitness ahead of the game against Arsenal but Pep definitely started him. He had an average game making some unusually poor decisions in front of goal but it's promising that he wasn't kept out for long and should feature in the upcoming game weeks. Now another doubt a lot of FPL managers have is that his effectiveness will reduce with the return of KDB. Although he blanked against Arsenal, there was nothing to suggest that. He was still loitering in and around the box, making good runs inside and trying to get a shot away whenever possible. So I think he would be okay there and surely would get some attacking returns in City's upcoming run of fixtures. Phil Foden is the last player in the City ranks that a lot of FPL managers are looking to get in their team and to be honest, it has been a bit of hit and miss with Phil Foden. Pep rotates him once in every 4-5 games and his game week time was also limited when KDB and Gundogan both were there in the playing 11 earlier this season. That doesn't mean he won't get starts but it's just that it becomes a bit tricky to own him. Regardless, his numbers in the last 5 game weeks have been impressive with 2 goals and 2 assists. His ownership also is almost one third of Gundogan but the latter represents higher value keeping in mind that both are similarly priced at the moment. I feel right now a double CD defence with one attacker still makes more sense than two attackers and a defender. In my opinion if you could afford it, Diaz and Cancelo along with Gundogan would be the best City trier to have right now. The next team that we'll talk about is Tottenham. They have really struggled over the past month or so, losing a lot of games in the Premier League. It's looking difficult for Spurs to get through the top 4 this year with so much competition and them having a bad form at the business end of the season. Tottenham is generally revolved around the presence of two players, Harry Kane and Hyung Min Son and the injury to Kane just a few weeks back really hurt them bad. Son in particular has been a bit of a concern. He's only scored once in his last few game weeks, making that his only attacking return. This run includes facing teams like Liverpool, Chelsea and Man City and the injury to Kane hasn't helped but these numbers don't give a good reading. Burnley and Fulham have improved defensively over the past few game weeks and it's not going to be that easy for Kane and Son considering the Spurs poor form. Obviously they can score against poor defences but considering their current state of play, do you really fancy them dispatching these teams with 3s and 4s? I don't think so. I doubt that's going to happen. More than 50% managers already own Son but he has not hurt managers like us in ranks because he has been blanking a lot. Kane on the other hand could be a differential of sorts. A lot of people who are thinking of getting both players in for the double might just go ahead with one and Kane could be that choice. He is obviously more expensive but is less owned. Almost half of Son's ownership and just looks like a better player than Son in FPL terms at the moment. Kane would also be a popular captain and triple captain option this week. Some managers would be put off by that performance against West Ham. The second half was a bit encouraging though but Kane and Son should have at least drawn level against the Hammers. There are some cheap options available in the likes of Watkins and DCL who also have a double game week but considering the next few fixtures, Spurs still possess some decent threat in goal and managers should at least look at having one if not both players in attack. The likes of Grealish could be upgraded to Son if you have the budget or even get Kane if you have some extra money lying around in attack. Now our next topic of discussion would be on the Leeds players. A lot of teams went into the double game week 25 with a triple up on Leeds. Some of the popular players were Stuart Dallas in defence, Rafinha who's still a great differential and the super popular Patrick Bamford who was captained by majority FPL managers last game week. Now Leeds have a difficult run of fixtures facing West Ham, Chelsea, Man City and Liverpool. 
We all have seen how open they leave themselves against the top teams who find so much space to attack the lead defense. Calvin Phillips is a huge player for Leeds at the center and they only have managed to win one out of the six games he has not featured in the league this season. Without him in the center, there's a huge void created and the attacking teams are taking advantage of the same. Leeds are anyways not a side known for their defense. Attack is their best form of defense, so Stuart Dallas is one player that could easily be moved and there are a lot of options in defense around the 5 million price bracket. You could easily replace him with the likes of Luke Shaw, who's also very attacking, or even Matt Target from Villa, who also has the potential to keep a few clean sheets. Now one thing to note here is that Leeds have a game against Fulham in game week 29, which will help you get through that tricky game week. So you might want to think before transferring out Stuart Dallas. You could also possibly replace him with one of the Brighton defenders who have also kept a lot of clean sheets in recent games and have gone a bit under the radar. They have a pretty decent run of fixtures till game week 30. The other option is obviously to hold them on your bench and play your other double game week players for game week 26 and then play Dallas in game week 29. Coming to a second Leeds player, Rafinha, who's also another great option for Leeds. He's passed the eye test and looks more dangerous with each passing game. He put in a great shift against Wolves, having 9 successful crosses, creating 6 chances and 3 big chances. On another day, he could have easily had a double digit haul and was unlucky not to get anything from the game. He's a definite hold for now in my opinion, he's not very high in price and his ownership is still quite less as compared to some of the players in that price range. In case you're planning to sell him, you can look at the likes of Gundogan or even Minamino from Southampton or Pereira from West Brom who are great differential options in more or less the same price bracket. Now coming to the most popular Leeds pick, Patrick Bamford. He's in fact the highest owned forward in the game by quite some distance. He's also the highest scoring forward in the past 5 game weeks currently tied with Timo Werner and is yet to play the game against Southampton in game week 25. Most of the FPL managers would have a lot of value attached to Bamford. We ourselves bought him for 6 million and now he's almost touching 7. Now some managers might move him on, especially those on a wild card in game week 30 or 31 as the games from there get really tough. Till then, he still has decent potential. You can replace him now as well with the likes of Watkins or even Danny Ings or DCL who have better fixtures. We also have to see the price point at which he's right now. He's now become slightly more expensive than the likes of Callum Wilson, Antonio and Ollie Watkins but his returns are way more than any of these. He's the second highest scorer in FPL this season, only behind Harry Kane and ahead of the likes of Jamie Wardy and DCL who are much higher in price than the Leeds forward. Let's get on with our next topic, the Merseyside conversation. Last game week was huge for both clubs as Everton was able to come out on top in the latest derby match. That result gave the Toffees their first win in 22 years at Anfield. A huge feat and something that all Evertonians will remember for quite some time. Everton definitely have the better record in recent times as compared to the Premier League champions. Liverpool are currently struggling in 6th place just ahead of their Merseyside rivals on goal difference having played an extra game. Now multiple serious injuries clearly have been a major factor in Liverpool's disappointing season so far. The defence in particular has been badly hit. Van Dijk, Joe Gomez and Joel Matip, three of their top centre-backs are out for the remainder of the season. Consequently, inexperienced youngsters including Nat Phillips have been put into the firing line while midfielders such as Jordan Henderson and Fabinho have also been tried there. Liverpool are a disappointing 14th in terms of goals conceded so far. Only 6 teams have a worse defensive record in the league this season. Now that's a concerning number but to be honest, defensive injuries have actually hampered their attack more than anything else. In addition, as accomplished as Jordan Henderson and Fabinho have often looked at the back, their dynamism and guile has often been missed in midfield. Now recent signings of Ben Davis and Kabak should help relieve some of the pressure on the squad but that itself will take some time. In spite of huge difficulties in defence, Liverpool's attacking inconsistencies have been their biggest problem this year. There have been far too many games where the front three of Firmino, Salah and Mane have looked really inconsistent. And that leaves us with a couple of really important questions. Starting with the first one, what to do with Liverpool defenders Trent Alexander-Arnold and Andrew Robertson? Managers are not rushing in to get Trent or Robertson in their FPL teams. Both Liverpool defenders have looked really off, especially from an FPL point of view. The problem with them is their price. They both cost more than 7 million. If you put things in perspective, they're costing more than the likes of Harvey Barnes, James Madison or even Patrick Bamford who are providing way more value in that price range. Their case has obviously not been held by the fact that Liverpool can't keep clean sheets at the moment. Their defensive numbers are really poor and though they have one of the best run of fixtures from now till the end of the season, it's more like a wait and watch game with the duo. Their attacking numbers too don't support the decision of getting them in your FPL teams. There is just so much value elsewhere in defence, especially considering the Man City assets. I would avoid both defenders for the double at least and see how things are with Kabak as their new centre-back. If they're able to keep a clean sheet or two and their attack starts firing, they could be a force to reckon with. It's something that we'll keep a close eye on. Coming to the next very important question, what to do with Mo Salah? Salah has been one of the best FPL assets over the past few years. 
This year too, he started the season strongly, but then came a poor run of 6 blanks. His numbers of the past 5 game weeks haven't looked that bad. He has scored 4 goals and has the highest XG among midfielders over the same period. But is he really worth it at that price range? Bruno Fernandes was a million cheaper, has been outscoring him and shows far greater value even if the Man United midfielder hasn't been on top of his game. Most of the FPL managers would have Salah and Fernandes and would probably be looking to move on the Egyptian for someone like a Son or even a Sterling who is providing better returns than Salah at the moment. A move to take out Salah downgrading him to a Barnes and upgrading one of your forwards looks like a better move right now. The thing is, if there's one player who I would like to own from Liverpool, it's definitely Mo Salah. Yes, he's gone quiet in a lot of the last few games, but Liverpool really have a good run of fixtures. We all have been waiting for Liverpool's fortunes to turn and to be honest, it has not at all happened so far. With Liverpool dropping out of the top 4 for the first time in the last couple of years, Klopp is expected to push his players to their absolute limit. We're still not going to take him out this week. One game is against Chelsea, but they also haven't really set the world on fire with their attacking displays. Defensively, they've definitely shown some signs of improvement, but most of their oppositions have been teams in the bottom half of the table, and Liverpool with Mo Salah could give Chelsea a couple of things to worry about. It also depends on your team and what fires you need to put out first. For us, it's not a higher priority transfer, and we would wait till after the double game week to take that call. Coming to their Merseyside rivals Everton, who have also had a decent season so far. Ancelotti would definitely think it could be better as Everton have not been consistent with their performances. More like Arsenal, you really don't know what to expect from the Toffees. They have a decent double game week facing Southampton and West Brom. Now coming to some of the Everton assets, Lucas Dean has been pretty good going forward for Everton, whipping in dangerous balls for the likes of Dominic Calvert-Lewin to attack. He did really well in his last game to contain Trent and kept the Liverpool fullback in check throughout the game. In total, he has 8 assists to his name across the season, only behind Cresswell's 9 who has played a lot more games than the Everton fullback. Now a couple of points to note here. His value makes him a premium pick and Everton are not keeping a lot of clean sheets and that diminishes his overall value to an extent. Everton though have a decent run of fixtures but are blanking in game week 29 so that could be another reason not a lot of FPL managers are going for him right now. As a result, his ownership is still just around 8%. Getting him in would mean adding a lot more value in defence, which in turn would result in you investing less in midfield and attack. FPL managers who are a bit risk-taking and would probably do things differently can get in Dean, replacing a second city defender and breaking away from the set defence template. Another creative player for Everton is this star midfielder James Rodriguez, who is showing this season that he still has it in him to compete at the top level. The Colombian started the season really well before getting injured a couple of times which has halted his progress. Now there's no doubt about his creativity on the pitch, but he doesn't like the physicality of the Premier League and it somewhat shows in his game. Ancelotti has been very careful in managing his game time and would continue to do so if they're dreaming of playing in Europe next season. Dominic Calvert-Lewin is the third Everton pick which is quite popular among FPL managers. He's the second most popular forward in the game ahead of the likes of Harry Kane and Jamie Vardy. His price makes him quite attractive and he looks to be back in form. For those of you who can't go up to Kane because of heavy investment in midfield and defence, DCL is a straightforward choice. His numbers across the last 5 game weeks have improved and he has managed to score 2 goals and get 2 assists to his name, making him the second highest scoring forward within the same time. He had a slight injury concern because of which he missed Everton's double game week in game week 24, but came off the bench and put in a great shift to help Everton get that 2-0 win against their rivals. Richarlison is the last Everton pick that we would like to highlight. The Brazilian generally plays wide for the Toffees, coming in more centrally when DCL is not on the pitch. He went on a run which saw him providing no attacking returns for 9 games before scoring a goal against Man City and Liverpool. So he definitely has it in him, but with DC on the pitch, I think it's an easy decision in terms of who to pick. The wide man doesn't have the same consistency as DCL had earlier this season and is also around 0.3 million more in price. When you compare both, DCL definitely edges on appeal in spite of having a much higher ownership. Now another team that has improved leaps and bounds this season is Aston Villa. They've looked a lot better in defence with some really good signings including Martinez in goal and Matty Cash in defence. Like Man City, a lot of FPL managers have doubled or even tripled up on Aston Villa assets but there are a few issues with that. Let's talk about it more in detail and understand how many Villa players are enough to have in your team. Martinez has been the best goalkeeper in FPL terms, providing clean sheets along with save points to help FPL owners boost their ranks. He's the highest owned keeper in the game with around 37% ownership. Matt Target is another option which has gone a bit under the radar this season. He's the only defender in the top 10 in terms of points who is below the 5 million range for now. His 13 clean sheets are quite impressive and a lot of credit definitely goes to Martinez but that's not it. He's also capable of providing attacking returns in terms of assists which adds to his overall appeal. Now one issue with having Martinez and or Target right now is the injury to cash in defence. That weakens them a bit with El Mohamedi filling in the void. 
It surely is a bit risky going with two Villa defense at the moment, but the fixtures really make a strong case. Plus, they also have a game in game week 29, so you don't really have anything to worry about there. If you're looking for a 5 million defender, Target is a strong choice. This also works well if you want to keep him on the bench and play the bench boost in game week 26. One player that has been very instrumental in all of Villa's attacks and how they've done so far is Jack Grealish. He is their talisman and his numbers tell you that story. Grealish has assisted 12 times so far this season and leads the overall numbers tied with Bruno Fernandes. Now that's the kind of impact he's had on this Villa side. Dean Smith would be sweating over his fitness over the coming weeks as he experienced some discomfort in training during the week and didn't feature in the game against Leicester City. Now the Villa boss is saying it's not a long term problem, but we'll wait for some more news on that. The absence of Grealish would leave Villa a bit short handed in attack. This would also mean more bad news for Ollie Watkins who relies heavily on Grealish's creative output to score his goals. The Villa striker has also been a great signing from the championship this season. He has fit into the system really well, scoring 10 goals this campaign and 2 in his last 5 matches. Ollie Watkins is a great option for Villa going forward and slots in really well if you're looking for a replacement for Antonio or a striker around the 6 million price range. Obviously if you have him, you should not sell him keeping the upcoming fixtures in mind. Whether to get him or not depends a lot on how and when Grealish can feature in the Villa side. Overall, I feel having 3 Villa players is a good option and provides you with an additional player to play in game week 29. As I just mentioned, there are two ways to go about it. Either have double Villa defence along with one of Watkins or Grealish assuming that he's fit for now. The other option is going for Martinez or Target if you have Pope or someone else as your keeper and then getting in both Grealish and Watkins. Obviously, if Grealish is not fit, you could either replace him or put him on the bench for any other players who have a double game week. Coming to our next team, Leicester City. They have been playing some really good football and come into this next set of fixtures in decent fashion having beaten Liverpool and Aston Villa in the last two games. I feel we should really consider Leicester assets with a lot more seriousness now, especially their attacking options. James Justin was a regular in our team before he got that really bad ACL injury but now we've had to replace him. There are a few options in Castagna and Pereira but they also have had injury spells and have just come back into the Leicester 11. Both haven't really done enough to justify their place back in our FPL team. An advantage with their defence though is their low ownership. Both Castagna and Pereira have a combined ownership of less than 5% and either one of them could provide a great boost to your rank in the coming game weeks. Now let's talk about some of their more secure attacking picks. We'll talk about the Leicester duo Harvey Barnes and James Madison first. Harvey Barnes has jumped up to the 8th spot in the overall FPL rankings in terms of points just about edging Madison. He's already the most transferred pick this week and with the injury news about Grealish coming out, we're also thinking of doing the same move. He's cheaper than the likes of Grealish and Madison and gives you the flexibility of investing that additional money elsewhere. His stats of the last 5 game weeks have also picked up. He has 13 goal attempts out of which he has scored on 3 occasions. He's also created 9 chances for his Leicester mates getting 2 assists in the process. His ownership is now picking up and has reached 11% at the time of recording this video. So he's surely a player you should look at for the next few game weeks. His teammate James Madison has been equally impressive for Leicester City this season. While Harvey Barnes is more direct and has a higher XG, Madison is a creative source. He has 3 assists to his name across the last 5 game weeks. His expected assist is the 4th highest among midfielders only behind Rafinha, Bruno Fernandes and Lukman, making Madison a really good option for the double game week 26 and beyond. A slight worry with him would be his fitness levels though. He came off with an issue with his hip. Brendan Rodgers said that he had an issue with his hip last season. He just felt it when he was taking the corner. So as a precaution they took him off and he will be examined over the next couple of days. Hopefully he should play because if he misses out, it will be a huge loss for the likes of Barnes and Vardy who depend on the attacker's creative exploits. Jamie Vardy is the final option in the Leicester attack. Vardy struggled for a few games before he got his hernia operation done. In spite of struggling for a few months now, he has still managed to score 12 goals this season and the Leicester forward would look to register himself on the score sheet after scoring only 2 goals in his last 14 game weeks. He did pounce on the communication error between Kabak and Allison and put the ball away into an empty net to score against Liverpool. Now the problem with Jamie Vardy is that his price would surely prevent a lot of FPL managers from going for him and rather invest a million and get Harry Kane from Tottenham. Wadi's ownership is around 19% and is definitely someone you should look at considering his ability to score against any big team in the Premier League. Man United, Leicester City's main rival for second place this season, are our next topic of discussion. They've had a roller coaster of a season, from being knocked out of the Champions League to leading the Premier League this season, United fans and supporters have seen everything. Their league form has been patchy in the last 5 game weeks, they find themselves 10 points behind Man City and face their noisy neighbours in game week 27. Let's talk about their defence first. To be very honest, the centre-back pairing of Harry Maguire and Victor Lindelof looks a bit dodgy. 
Maguire is more assured in defence with Eric Bay and their performances clearly suggest that. Sadi Bay and Lindelof both are not fantasy options because of uncertainty on who will start alongside Harry Maguire. Harry Maguire though is an assured starter and looks United's best defender over the long run of games. He also possesses great attacking threat from set pieces and has been really unlucky not to get more goals this season from headers. Luke Shaw is another really good option especially considering his creative output. He has created an impressive 19 chances over the last 5 game weeks and that is 10 more than the second highest player Trent. These numbers show the importance of Shaw and at a price little less than Harry Maguire, he's United's best defensive asset to have. Man United really don't have the easiest of fixtures, facing a resurgent Chelsea and the league leaders Man City in two of their next three fixtures. This also tells us that he'll be required to do a lot more defending than usual, reducing his attacking threat. In spite of that, if I had to pick one option from the United defence, I would definitely go the Luke Shaw route. He's nowhere must-have, but he's definitely more creative than Harry Maguire and gets more involved in the game than the United skipper. Coming to United's midfield, there's one name that clearly is on top. He's United's creative machine Bruno Fernandes. Guys, what a signing he has been for the Red Devils. He has been directly involved in more than 50% of United's goals in the Premier League this season. His fantasy numbers are off the roof and he's the highest scoring player in FPL this season, sitting pretty at 190 points. Now one problem with the United midfielder has been his ability to score FPL points against the likes of Man City, Arsenal, Liverpool and Chelsea. He's facing two of those opponents in his next three games and managers believe that there are chances that he might not do well against those teams. While the stats support that argument, he has been United's best player this season by a long long way. Whatever good United does on the pitch goes through him and he would want to justify the same notion against the bigger clubs. Both of these are must-win matches for Solskjaer, especially the City one. The last one was a dull nil-nil draw where no team was playing to win but to avoid defeat. Hopefully this time things should be different as United are chasing City in the title race and big players often shine in important moments. So what should we do with Bruno Fernandes? I would say if you have him, you should definitely hold him. He's a good shout for captain and triple captain this week and United seem to always nick a penalty from somewhere. He's on all spot kicks and free kicks, giving him that additional creative juice required to win the match for his club. The other option in United's midfield is Marcus Rashford. He's the 7th highest scoring midfielder in FPL this season. His price is what makes him go a bit unnoticed. The likes of Gundogan, Grealish and the Leicester boys have similar returns but are a lot cheaper in price so having Rashford becomes a bit tricky. It also takes up another premium spot in your midfield which would definitely have Bruno Fernandes. So in a way, he's probably competing with the likes of Son and Grealish who have outperformed the United attacker across the FPL season. Doubling up on the United attack, considering their two tricky fixtures is definitely risky. Rashford's ownership is just around 11% which is encouraging but I just feel having Bruno Fernandes for that premium is more suited to FPL teams. Southampton is another club that some managers are looking at in terms of the FPL assets. They put in a spirited performance against Tuchel's Chelsea to restrict them to a point but in general their performance levels have dropped considerably over the past few game weeks. They played a double game week in 25 and have another one in game week 27. Now the problem I see with them is that they only have one game in game week 26 making a bit tricky to own and play that week. In any case, let's look at some of the options from Southampton. Their defence has had a really tough time including that huge 9-0 loss at the hands of Man United. Injuries to key players and suspensions have not really helped the Saints cause. Alex McCarthy has not kept a clean sheet in his last 7 matches and his form has been quite questionable to say the least. He still has decent ownership and a lot of FPL managers would have continued with him because of his price and the additional transfer that you'll have to make on a goalkeeper. But if you're not on a wildcard, I would just keep him for the moment. If you're using a your wildcard, then I don't see a point of holding him in your team. There are definitely better options available in Martinez and Nick Pope from Burnley. Yannick Westergaard is also back from injury, a defender who was really important in Saints' good defensive record before things went south. He's a huge presence in the centre of that defence and commands his backline really well. He's also scored 3 goals so far this season and provides a huge aerial threat from set pieces which is a bonus. He's also only priced at 4.7 million and if there was an option to go for him or McCarthy, I would definitely go ahead with him. There are a couple of other Southampton options that FPL managers can look out for. James Watt-Prowse is probably the best set piece taker in the Premier League but he majorly depends on them to provide any attacking returns. At 6 million, there are a lot of better options available. The other interesting option is the Liverpool loanee Takumi Minamino. He has been something different in the Saints attack, providing two attacking returns in his last three starts for Southampton. He's also priced at 6 million, so there's a huge competition for budget midfielders, but if there's a choice between him and Watt Prowse, I would pick the Liverpool attacker. Our final pick is probably the most important pick from Southampton's point of view. It's the star striker Danny Ings. He has been an influential figure in the Saints attack post his transfer from Liverpool. 
This season though has been a topsy-turvy one from him and he would like to finish on a high. A lot of FPL managers would have transferred in links before the game week 25 deadline as there was no news on the double game weeks at the time. He is playing Man City in game week 27 but has a decent run of fixtures after that. Southampton don't have a game in game week 29 so that'll be a challenge but you could easily do inks to Kane if you have the money and if Harry Kane is somehow still not in your FPL team. Out of all these players, Dannings is the one I would go for. In fact, he's already in our FPL team. Mostly, we won't be transferring him out this week to get a double game week player. We'll also wait on news of Creelish because if he's fit, then Oli Watkins becomes a decent option as well and we'll see if we need to make that transfer. Our final topic of the day includes the bottom half clubs. Let's talk about them and see if there are some decent differentials or even some bench boost options available. The first team that we are covering is Burnley. They recently had a double game week and a lot of us took Burnley defenders for the double game week 24. Now as a result, a lot of us would be having Burnley assets and one very important question would be what to do with them going forward. Game week 24 saw a lot of FPL managers getting in a double Burnley defense with Nick Pope in goal and one of Ben Mee, Tarkowski or Loughton. We also got in Loughton who gave us a massive haul so really happy there. Now Burnley also have a double game week in game week 26, so Nick Pope becomes an automatic pick. The games are not great, Tottenham and Leicester would be a huge mountain to climb, but Pope could give you some safe points as these teams will have a lot of attempts on goal. In case if you have Martinez though, playing him over Pope would be a sensible move. Also if you're playing your bench boost, then it's even okay to play Pope on the bench and get any points possible. If you're really falling short of double game week players, you could also play one of the Burnley defenders. You never know, Sean Dyke could just shut up shop. It might get tricky for the likes of Tottenham who are not really in great form. For the game weeks after, you can easily switch these players to probably a Brighton defender who are also a better defensive side than Burnley. In case you got rid of players like Dallas, bringing them back for game week 29 could also be one possible option. Now let's talk about the second club, Fulham. Fulham is one bottom club which doesn't have a lot of decent FPL options but Scott Parker's side has been doing really well over the past few game weeks. They are only 3 points behind Newcastle and could easily leapfrog them with a couple of wins. Fulham also have a double game week facing their London rivals Tottenham and Crystal Palace who are struggling a lot at the moment. The fixtures after that are quite difficult so I'd probably not suggest getting in a new Fulham player but if you already own the likes of Areola, Aina or even Adamola Lookman and have your bench boost available, you could play them on the bench in game week 26. Coming to the 19th place team West Brom. West Brom along with Sheffield United don't look like they'll survive the drop zone this season. Fixtures for West Brom though are a lot easier than Fulham till game week 28. While the West Brom defense needs to be avoided at all costs, there are a couple of risky differentials that you can play as a part of your bench boost if you already own them. If West Brom would score, Pereira and Diagne are likely to be involved in the build-up or score the goals themselves. They are super super differential with a combined ownership of only 2% and could really help you in your mini leagues if you're lagging behind in rank. It's a very risky short term move so be aware that it might not come off as expected. The final team that we are covering today is Brighton. They have looked really solid defensively keeping 5 clean sheets in the last 6 matches. They would be one of the teams that a lot of FPL managers would look at when they are either preparing for their bench boost or the playing 11 in the blank double game week 29. There are a few defensive options and based on your overall budget and strategy you can take your pick. If you need a second keeper or someone for your bench boost on a budget then Sanchez is the cheapest first team goalkeeper you'll get. Obviously he gives you all those safe points along with a clean sheet if Brighton keep one. Now seriously at 4.5 million he's a real bargain. You could also look at Lewis Dunk, Ben White or Dan Byrne depending on your budget. Ben White is probably the most valuable player of the lot. He's only priced at 4.4 million at the moment and provides the same clean sheet potential as a slightly more priced Dunk. Dunk definitely offers a higher goal threat but you could take a call depending on the money you have remaining in your bank. Dan Byrne is the cheapest Brighton defender at 4.2 million and also has started the last 3 games for Brighton. He will definitely play further forward and could provide an insane value if he gets an attacking return for the Seagulls. So that will be all for today's video. We have tried to cover the majority of the teams that are viable from an FPL point of view for the upcoming game weeks. Now there are a few teams that we have not covered in this video in detail. Chelsea have a really tough double game week but their fixtures turn from the next week. We'll cover more of that next week in our preparation for game week 27. Arsenal and West Ham don't have any double game weeks and don't look very attractive in the short term. Like Chelsea, we'll talk about them more in the coming game weeks as both do have a fixture in game week 29. Hope this video was helpful guys, we've tried to address all the major concerns that you would have before making your transfers and locking in your teams for double game week 26. 
In case we've missed out on something, let us know in the comments below and we'll be happy to take your questions and help you make the right choices. Guys, if you liked today's video and found this useful, please hit the like button. It would really mean a lot to us. Subscribe to our channel Insanely Football if you're new around here. Make sure you hit the bell icon if you want to get notified of our upcoming content. Our next video will come out on Friday where we'll talk about our team selection for game week 26, best captain picks and we'll also be doing some drafts and tinkering to help all the wild carders out there. It's going to be a lot of fun so make sure to check that out as well. Keep tinkering with your teams till then and I'll see you in Saners next time.